Welcome to our webinar um, sponsored by AECT CLT Division and Boise State University. Today we have Dr. Amy Bradshaw speaking and she's going to tell us a little bit about critical pedagogy and instructional design and technology, a dialectic tour toward equity and inclusion. Amy, thank you so much for offering to come and join us today and tell us a little bit about your work. I'm super excited to hear this talk um, because anytime I've ever tried to attend your talk before, I've always had something else <laughs> at the AECT conference. So um, I'm sure that uh, this is gonna be super, super great. And we're, gonna, we're excited to be able to record it and post it later on so everyone will have the link. Um, Thank you so much for the invitation, and I am delighted to be here myself. Yeah, so could you introduce yourself a little bit before you sure. get started? Sure. Amy Bradshaw. I'm faculty at the University of Oklahoma in the College of Education, um, specifically in what has been the Instructional Psychology and Technology program for uh, a long time, and we have recently changed uh, our program to Learning Sciences, but we still do Instructional Design and Technology as one of several pieces that we do. So my um, background is kind of interdisciplinary and uh, visual literacy and good communication for instructional support has been one of my focuses for decades. And in the last maybe five or six years, I've intentionally and overtly turned my attention to interrogating my own practices as an instructor and as an academic and also interrogating the dominant practices of the field of instructional design and technology for the ways that we are unintentionally complicit in perpetuating inequities and injustices through our very instructional practices and materials. So what this presentation does, uh, it's based on a chapter that's in the um, what is the the Benson Moore, uh, Benson Joseph and Moore, see culture learning and technology research and practice book that came out in 2017. This is one of those chapters. And I have done a similar type of presentation on the same topic at AECT probably in 17 or 18 um, that year. So this is, if, if this looked familiar to you, it, uh, you may have been at one of those sessions, but I'm delighted to see everybody again. Um, did that answer the question? Yes, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so interrogating the practices of um, ways that we are unintentionally complicit. And so one of the touchstones for me in helping me figure out how to grapple with these issues through our field has been um, my earlier exposure during my own doc studies to educational philosophy and critical pedagogy in specific. And so as I started looking at our field generally, dominant mainstream practices, and also um, trying to look at how that might look through a lens of critical pedagogy or other fields that are specifically focused on equity and inclusion, and try to see where are the points of similarity and difference. And it really came about through questioning of like, why, why does it seem that issues of equity, inclusion, diversity, and belonging why do those seem to be marginal or um, not required aspects um, that, that come into focus in most of mainstream instructional design and technology? And I'm not asserting that nobody cares about those issues, just that they, my experience has been that they are not usually the central focus around everything around which everything else is based. So I've been spending some time in various other projects inquiring and theorizing about um, why that is. And there are a couple of other articles that focus on that. But this one specifically is trying to look at what would it look like if we looked at our, our practices either as instructional technologists or as instructional designers, instructional design and technology folk uh, through the lens of um, critical pedagogy. And not as a way of saying our field is bad or wrong, but more looking at it um, that every field has tendencies to prioritize ways of knowing. And so what is mentioned in this chapter is that the um, citations from other people about the construct of epistemological ignorance that happens within all fields. And I think that in our field, uh, the systemic, the structural ways that inequities perpetuate 
falls into kind of that area of epistemological ignorance. So let me start here. This, this what, I, what you're seeing is kind of an overview of what's available in that chapter. And I put the link in the chat and we'll put it back there. Lisa will pop that back in there in a minute. So that if you don't already have access to this chapter and you'd like to download and read it, I'd be happy for you to do that. And if you have any questions about it during this session or afterwards, I love talking about these ideas. I feel like this chapter was a start to these ideas, but there's a lot more uh, that needs to be done. And as you can see here, I've added uh, a, an asterisk by the parts of the chapter that I want to talk about specifically in a little bit of detail in this session, but the ones that don't have the asterisk um, they're more available in the chapter than what we'll have time for today. Um, so the, the basic premises of critical pedagogy are that it's, it's based on the desire to develop in ourselves and in others this critical consciousness, the ability to see how our work fits in um, with the world and, and see beyond our own perspectives and uh, education for as a practice of freedom and education toward liberation. So other aspects of um, critical pedagogy that are really central um, to it are dialogue, trust, critical humility, and the practice of radical love. And this is all based on uh, the work of Paulo Freire. Um, educational spaces are inherently political is another central premise of critical pedagogy. So oftentimes people who do work trying to interrogate their own fields or look at, at um, potential limitations or problems within the field specifically related to social inequities and to race and ethnicity and class um, differences, inequities. Oftentimes uh, that work is called uh, political and uh, used as a way to silence people from criticizing the field, they'll label it as political. And central to critical pedagogy is the idea that all educational spaces are inherently political, that you can't take that aspect out of education. The choices of where and how to teach, what can be spoken, and what must remain silent, those are all political acts. Um, the, the political choice to remain silent when you perceive something doesn't feel right, but maybe you don't know how to articulate it, or maybe you sense that there may be a penalty for raising certain questions. Those are reflections of the political nature of education. So that's always there. By questioning, we're not introducing politics. It's, all, it's already there. Uh, so critical pedagogy is interested in looking at education as specifically as a practice of freedom. So there are other ways of looking at education. One can be as a practice of perpetuating cultural values or cultural practices or what makes a good democracy or what do people need to know in order to get a job. So whatever the values are uh, in educational, in decision makers about what's gonna be in education come to be inherent in the practice. For critical pedagogy uh, enabling liberation, liberation of others and of ourselves as educators is key. And then an idea that we'll talk a little more about is praxis. So you may already um, be familiar with conceptions of praxis that are a blending of theory and practice. That's kind of a general um, quick definition of it. Paulo Freire was very much more specific about what praxis is. It's not just theory and practice, but it's articulating what the central issue is at hand. So if there are um, injustices or problems or dynamics that are inhibiting liberation or liberatory practices, then accurately articulating, naming what those are uh, is very important. And then after you name it or in conjunction with naming it, would be critically reflecting on what the issues are, what, what's connected with the issues, what are causes, who are the stakeholders, who is harmed, who benefits, what are the issues of power, um, what are the barriers to change, um, what are the methods for transformation. And then in addition to naming and um, critically reflecting, would then be taking appropriate action 
So those three components are necessary aspects of praxis from Freire's perspective. And I don't mean to imply that it's one and then the other and then the other in a strictly linear um, fashion, but that these can be recursive and going on at the same time and revisiting back and forth. So that's a central idea to critical pedagogy. And then I think I already mentioned the education for liberation, also education for transformation purposes. So a lot of times in mainstream educational settings, we think about education as perpetuation of cultural values or education as transmitting or sharing or spreading cultural values. Um, that's not enough for critical pedagogy. Critical pedagogy is specifically interested in transforming contexts and settings so that they are more liberatory, so that they are more inclusive, so that um, they are more empowering of people. And this requires attention to people at the margins of our society and at our culture. So there's a very different priority if you're engaging in education with your top value being, how can I make sure that I'm being inclusive of everybody? How can I be paying attention to what the power dynamics are and how some people benefit unjustly from circumstances and some people are penalized unjustly from circumstances beyond their own control? If that's um, a central dynamic that one is keeping in mind as we're engaging in education, you get very different outcomes than, for example, if efficiency is the top value um, that you're keeping in mind while you're engaging education, or if um, efficacy uh, is, or you know, what what are the um, results on standardized testing? So, what, whatever our priority is, going to change the trajectory and the impact of um, what the educational endeavor is all about. So that's kind of uh, the first part of that chapter is available, looks at those specific issues. And then we turn and we'll look at tensions and resonances between critical pedagogy and educational technology. And I went with educational technology as more broadly. I see instrumental technology as a big overlap with that. Uh, and then the chapter moves on toward, um, toward a praxis of equitable and inclusive um, practice and it uses the conception of praxis consistent with Freire for dealing with what I am seeing as the issue that I want to address and that's specifically the lack of attention in educational technology and instructional uh, technology instructional design and technology contexts specifically to addressing equity and inclusion so we'll walk through that a little bit and then go to some closing comments are there any questions yet I don't see anybody moving, so if I missed you, um, be a little bit more loud. Uh, so, Freire um, talked about, sorry, part of my screen is hidden, so I'm having to look to see. I gave you the, the definition of the naming, critically reflecting, and taking meaningful action as um, praxis, but the whole point of praxis is the reflection and action upon the world in order to transform it. And we can unpack that a little bit, like what does that mean, reflection? What does it mean, action? What does it mean, the world? Who's, whose conception and perception of the world? And then how do we transform it? How can we possibly transform it? Uh, all three elements, the naming critically, reflecting, and taking meaningful action are necessary in order for appropriate change to happen. And this isn't to say that if you engage these three parts that you'll necessarily always end up with the intended transformation and that the transformation that you do come up with is not necessarily going to be um, static or it might necess not necessarily meet all the goals um, that you seek. But if you don't engage all in all these, you're even less likely to achieve um, the goals. So if a problem is not accurately named before reflection and action are engaged, then there's a high risk of the issue being misperceived and subsequently being inadequately addressed or, or wrongly addressed. If an appropriate dynamic is accurately named, but action is taken without the critical reflecting step, just jumping right over to the last part, wrong action can be taken or harmful dynamics can be exacerbated or additional harms um, can be created. 
and then if a harmful dynamic is accurately named and um, critical reflection is appropriately engaged, but then no action is taken, then uh, the status quo inequities perpetuate. So as I mentioned quickly earlier before that writing this chapter was part of my own personal and ongoing um, praxis for remaining in this field of instructional design and technology. As I had started looking around for who else is doing this work, and there are other people doing work in this area, but it's it's been hard to find it in the mainstream or we've been dealing with it under the label of digital divide and giving it a little bit of attention or dealing it under the label of um, ethics and then giving it a little bit of attention and it hasn't really become central. So what I want to do is make it central for all of us. Not, not saying that everybody has to only be looking at equity and inclusion, but that if we are doing whatever our other focuses are, AI, gaming, whatever it is, if we're not also including equity and inclusion and belonging as one of the central values um, with that, then there's a strong likelihood that we're going to be achieving the opposite or, or the absence of the equity and inclusion and belonging. I'm going to pause in case anybody wants to jump in with question or comment. So as, as part of this, um, as, as part of my own trying to come to like what are the areas for potential overlap or resonance between these two fields and what are the areas where they may be very different and there's either room to try to reconcile or maybe it's not reconcilable. Who knows, we'll have to try. Um, part of critical pedagogy is extremely interested in transformative education as we said at the very beginning and so Friday looked at a contrast between transformative education and transmissive modes of education, which he referred to as banking models, which is knowledge is a commodity that you can take and replicate and transmit to other people so that other people can have that same knowledge that you have. That's not the way we look at it under critical pedagogy. It's more consistent with a critical interpretivist critical interpretivist perspective that everyone comes to um, potential new knowledge or, or understanding or dynamics and we each bring to it the sum of our past experience and perspectives and um, past knowledge and interactions and then we try to interpret the new stimulus or information or relationships coming to us trying to make sense of it. So critical pedagogy is recognizing that and then trying to help um, facilitate not just discovery, but the construction of new knowledge, that knowledge needs to be newly constructed for every person, not just transmitted. So he referred to um, transmitted knowledge as a corpse because it's dead. Somebody else discovered it and they're just transmitting it to you or to me. It's, it's not something that we have vested interest in. It's just like a commodity, a factoid that we're accepting um, in, in contrast to the new construction knowledge production, which brings with it aspects of motivation and excitement. Uh, transmissive education tends to be more directive, authoritarian, more based on facts, tends to be more um, declarative level. Um, content teacher or task centered tends to be more common. Um, and also tends to be more closed-ended and very well-defined. Contrast with transformative education. So this is also um, overlaps fairly well with interpretivist versus more positivist or directed um, modes as well. So in transformative education, the learning has to be grounded in learners' own directly lived contexts and experiences. So you can, you can link this up with various different learning theories. So maybe Maybe in our current practice, the best we do is schema activation. If we want to draw on schema theory for how do you teach somebody new knowledge, well, you have to connect it to someone, something that they already know. With critical pedagogy, it's not just enough to make that connection, that it needs to um, be strongly contextualized in what they know. And in fact, I'm not going to determine for you all what you need to learn. I'm, I, I should, as a critical pedagogue, be inviting you to tell me what what your needs are, that I need to respect your 
understanding of what your own condition is and and what your own um, world is like and what you see as the needs that you have so that's that's easier to do if I go into like a, a small village somewhere and I say what do you what do you you people who live in this village what do you want me to help you with there's there's shades of imperialism and you know saviorism in that as well but but we can we can try to convince ourselves that that would be easier to accomplish in some other settings than as corporate instructional designers for example where we're hired to be on hand to help develop instruction around whatever topic we're asked to do. But if we think about who, who is doing the asking to develop those learning modules or whatever they are, is it the, the learners themselves that are requesting that we help them learn the thing? Or is this some other hierarchically superior person telling us, we need you to design this for those people over there and so then we try with our best practice to say, well, at least I'm going to do an audience analysis. I'm really going to understand who these people are and what they need from their perspectives. But the whole beginning of it is based on somebody else's idea of what is needed. And if we also look at why are we having, why are we doing this? If we're working in a corporate setting, then the ultimate motivation is money making process, right? That even if we say we are a money or for-profit teaching institution or even a non-profit teaching institution. I mean, I'm, I work at a public university and we only get maybe a little more than 11% of our budget comes from um, the legislature and yet we're still considered public. So even, even public supposedly not-for-profit institutions are faced with forced to um, grapple with how do you bring in money in order to give back and somebody's going to be making the decisions about what people need to learn. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent there, but it, it, it's central to this idea about transmissive versus transformative and who is deciding what needs to be known. So one place uh, where there could be potential for attempts toward reconciliation would be in that uh, audience analysis and in the needs analysis stage. So we could do that very perfunctory and very quick. We know who they are and let's describe their ages and their genders and what their educational background experiences. We could, we could analyze the audience in the context in very de declarative ways, just to say, here's the facts about what's going on. Or we could potentially go in a little bit, a lot deeper. Um, and, and bring in more uh, of what are the values and what are the, the modes and what are the personal experiences and what are the personal relationships and needs and pressures on that audience. And um, I'm, I'm stretching here a little bit too. This, this is not a, a problem that I can say, okay, all you corporate instructional designers, now you're gonna be transformative and base everything that you design on what the ultimate learners want because you are working in a context where you can't base it completely on theirs. But are there ways you can move toward that? So Amy, can, this is yeah. Kay. It's okay if we jump in vocally, Hi, right? <laughs> okay, so, so I was going to say, and I kind of tried to type it out, but maybe verbally I can say it better. I know in so many instances, the decisions on what is going to be taught even in, in higher education is based on stakeholders, and the stakeholders usually translate who are the businesses, right. who are the local businesses, who do, they, who do they want to hire, what kind of employees do they want, what kind of training do they want. And on the other end of that is maybe we're training very good employees, but how often do, do we tell our employees, okay, so I mean our students is, okay, you're going into this field, even if it's technology, you know, technology workers unionize. Do we ever teach them about unionizing? Right. Do we ever teach them about what what crunch time is if they're going to work for a game company and 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 how they want to find out about that before they go and work for a certain company? Do do we teach them about is is there is there any kind of sexism in that in that company? What what's going on in the technologies in the say the technology organization or the technology field even or whatever whatever. Um, field it is how often do we do we talk about the negatives and things that they might need to protect themselves as if they are going to be workers in there versus how we tell them how we tell them more or less and what the what they would hear at an mba school 
great. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. And it's so true. And like if we, in, in our training as instructional designers, if we're never even exposed to those questions or those issues or their concerns, those concerns, for sure there's no way we're going to be able to communicate that with the end learners. Uh, we're not only not taught about those things, but we're, we're not taught, we're taught not to even think about those things. So this is where some epistemological ignorance comes in. Um, ways that what how we learn about how people learn is limited to exclude some of many of those things that you just said but they're not even valued it, it becomes so if you've heard of um, explicit curriculum and hidden curriculum and then the third one is the null curriculum so if explicit curriculum is what the company owners uh, or supervisors asked you to teach the hidden curriculum might be those things that you don't explicitly state, but they come through. So you, I may never say don't interrupt me, but through my action and through my modes of engagement, I might be communicating pretty clearly to you that I don't want to be interrupted. Even if I invite you, if I say, please interrupt me, and then somebody does based on how I respond, I could be still giving the message of don't. So there's explicit and hidden. And then the null curriculum is that kind of not just content, but even ways of perceiving, even ways of asking, even ways of thinking um, that are completely excluded from the learning environment. So I think many of those things you just suggested, they are null curriculum in, um, in our field and in many fields. I keep being reminded by the people closest to me, you know, you're, you're talking a lot about how instructional design and technology is missing these things, but every field is missing these, these things. And I don't know about every field, but Surely a lot of uh, them are. Did you have more to say, Kate? No, that, that I mean, my, my biggest one is, is always about how we're teaching our students to be great workers <laughs> for, for an organization. And I mean, human performance improvement, that's exactly what it is. But, you know, there's, there is an other, there's another side to it that we usually don't even mention. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So compliance is taught whether it's overt or hidden, uh, covert, it comes through. You, you get go along, get along, don't speak up, don't rock the boat, rise to the top. Uh, we are sometimes taught in leadership um, areas to like sit next to the boss, um, show the boss how you agree with them, or you know, do all these things to comply and get along, which when you see things that don't feel right or seem actually harmful, we're at least covert hidden curriculum, if not directly overt, uh, taught not to speak up about those. So the, so that, and then the no part is we don't even have the language to articulate the, the issues that we're seeing or sensing and can't quite put into words because we haven't been taught how to engage those ways. So I'm not asserting that this is necessarily I'm not asserting that this is an intentional thing that happens in our field, but I am asserting that it is a thing that happens in our field. So if we, if we want to understand it and recognize that it is an issue that we want to transform somehow, then praxis, in Freudian terms of praxis, is offers hope for being able to do this. And so carefully articulating what this issue is that we recognize, critically reflecting on Lisa mentioned stakeholders and between your words, um, you, were, you were talking about the, what are the official stakeholders, the, the recognized and overtly mentioned stakeholders, but there are many other stakeholders. So in addition to the learners of that system, the families of that system, the towns, the, the communities of those systems, the, the students in the schools, the funding that goes to those schools. I mean, if you, if you really look at who are the stakeholders, we are shaping our whole communities and countries and societies and social systems. If our work is only perpetuating the status quo and um, reifying and perpetuating and upholding the values and goals and purposes and desires of the corporate owners and supervisors, then are we, are we serving 
exclusively as tools of the corporate owners to uh, support realization of their desires, which is not based on values of altruism, it's based on values of bottom line and money making and efficiency. And we can throw efficacy in there if efficacy is tied to it won't get funded again unless we can show that it had a good um, learning result. So the efficacy and actually I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it, it's, it's to where I think we need to ask ourselves, what is my role in this industry generally? And what is my role in the specific context? So one of the... Amy? Yes, Jacob. Sorry, this is Jake. Um, Hi. Uh, yeah, for, the, for efficacy, I always ask my students in terms of like, um, like on whom did it have the impact, like for whom, and are we just looking at um, technology's impact on a specific set of learners, all our learners, right, uh, or our field. Right. So, yeah, I think, I think it's important to even uh, broaden the conversation beyond, try to push back even against some of those uh, maybe... Um, grant funded requirements of trying to say well let's let's look at specific sets of learners uh, other than just I don't know the ones that always get measured and looked at so you're right thank you for adding that I, I agree with you and, and I'm glad that you're pushing there and I do think that it's our job it's not always included in our training as being our job or maybe it is more and less um, but it is our job I think uh, to push back or to learn how to push back, even if that hasn't been our overt um, curriculum of our, of our training is how do, how do you push back? And so asking the question of if you're working in, I keep saying corporate setting, but if you're working in any setting where you're designing instruction and you're being asked to teach a thing or teach in a way of a thing that doesn't seem right or seems problematic at best, um, how, how can you push back in a way that lets you retain your job if that's what you want to do because you have to live too and you need a place to live and you need to eat food and all these other things too. How, how is it, are there ways that you can retain your job while also pushing back to open up more space for more equity? In some places that's easier than others and I'm, I'm not trying to say that there are always easy ways to coming to that because I think often there aren't. Sometimes if you push back, you'll be immediately written off or dismissed. Sometimes you'll be given room to explore further as long as you can do it quickly and as long as it doesn't derail what the primary um, priorities are of the group you're working for. Um, but sometimes empowering individuals and empowering marginalized people and supporting development of internal locus of control and so sometimes these um, goals and priorities are seen as threats to the overriding purpose of the the group that one may be working for. So I'm I, I think he's he is mentioned in this article. Um, Paul Gorski is someone to look up. He's he's been talking a lot in the last few years about a, a construct of um, equity literacy that it's not enough to know about different cultures and it's not enough to be culturally competent that we really need to, those things are good, but we need to also understand equity literacy and what can we be doing? How can we be growing in ourselves and transforming um, ourselves so that we exist as a threat to inequity? And that, that question or that um, challenge I think helps us think about our jobs in different ways. Am I operating as a perpetuator of inequity, whether I mean to or not? Or is, are there possibilities for my work to exist as a threat to inequity while also fulfilling my job as an instructional technology? And sometimes these are not clear yes and no's. These are like, huh, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm going to have to explore that. And maybe I don't have enough information yet. So, so if you don't have enough information, then the critical reflection part comes in about who, who can I connect with, who can help me understand what I wasn't taught, right? Or, or my lived experience didn't teach me. And 
here I am, a white woman born in the United States. Uh, a lot of us are, we, we, a lot of us, even though we may come from very humble beginnings, we may come, we may be first generation students, there may be a lot of things about our own individual lives that made life difficult for us. In this country, we who are white did not have race and ethnicity added on to whatever other difficulties that we had that make life challenging or impossible in some settings. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that I have been raised, despite whatever difficulties I personally faced, there are a lot of potential difficulties that I did not face that were not anything to do with my own merit or skill um, that other people do have to face on the daily, multiple times a day, that are not their fault, that are not, that are based on systemic things going on. You get where I'm going with this. So what I'm saying is there, there's ignorance that I have as a result of my positionality, as a result of being born in the United States, Caucasian, female. There are things I, I know and have experience with and there are things that I just don't. So how am I going to learn about those things that I don't have direct access to understanding? Um, so, please. So, Amy, I'm curious as you're thinking about this, are you thinking about um, sort of formal institutional contexts for teaching? You know, undergrad I'm, or graduate programs, professional programs, um, actually within the corporation? Because it seems to me the contexts and opportunities for engaging in conversations are so different yeah. based on that. And, and the opportunity to have a conversation in an, in an academic program may have, you know, there, you, you might still have to go to bat to carve that out. Absolutely. But, the, but there's a space there in which that might be assumed. Or you can look and see, you know, if it's an undergraduate degree, you know, is it part of the kinds of educational experiences that they're going to encounter, which is so different than if your task is within an organization and that's the space in which you're learning and, and you're, it's a much more limited kind of context often. So I, I'm curious what you have in mind. I think you're right and I think those are super important and I thank you for raising those. That, that really is central specifically where our, if we all of us here or our um, secondary audiences are instructional designers, it's really critical. So I, I can feel that sometimes in my department um, within education, within instructional psychology and technology, within ed psych settings, some of these ideas that I'm talking about don't particularly get a lot of enthusiastic uptake because they can be perceived as a threat to the existing way of doing things. And yet I also recognize that it's way easier for me to do this in an academic setting where I have colleagues in other departments or in other colleges or other settings who at least I can communicate with about the issues I'm struggling with. And for an instructional designer who's part of a large corporation, who may be one of like either the only instructional designer or a very small team of people, not all of whom have considered the necessity of these ideas. And maybe maybe the whole corporate culture is, we're, we're here to support the bottom line development. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that the pressures are much higher and harder um, to, to navigate in particular settings. So to answer, to try to answer the question, I'm really interested and open to seeing how this um, can be explored and developed and worked with in all of these settings. And I do agree with you that it's going to be different in all of the settings. So I'm not ready to say it's impossible in any of these settings, but I do think it's much more challenging in some than in others. So I'm interested in figuring out um, what are some ways collectively that we can find supports for each other to grow and develop in our own understandings. Uh, Friede looked at liberation not as something that we give to other people, that that's, that's a wrong way of looking at it. If I want to help liberate somebody else, quote unquote, I mean, I need to be also focused on liberating myself from my own prejudices and my own um, practices of injustice and my own um, epistemological ignorance. So epistemological ignorance is the ignorance that we have that we are taught to be ignorant about certain things. No one has to do that intentionally for that to happen. So 
so yeah, I'm interested in finding ways to support networking and connection and support for the continual growth of all of us because the only way we can address this effectively is to be working on ourselves at the same time that we're, we're working on potential outcomes for other people. So if, if, if we are instructional designers in corporate settings where this just seems impossible, maybe we can't find anyone else in that particular corporate setting who senses there's an issue here. Maybe we're not even able to articulate clearly, but we sense that there's something uncomfortable about this. Maybe while we continue to be open to finding other people within the corporate system that have this interest and are willing to explore it, we also need to be cultivating um, and developing relationships with people outside of that context that can be help us help us be thinking about how to make changes. And maybe the changes are big, but usually the changes are multiple and very small and inward as well as outward. So it's, it's kind of like um, if you're dealing with the issue of racism in general, no matter how hard you work, you may not solve it, but you know you won't solve it if you don't work at it. So this isn't meant to be a negative or futile statement. Um, there is hope that you can achieve change and transformation and justice, but that's not going to happen without committed effort involving a lot of us. Um, another point that I want to add, since I've now said that two or three times about how hard it is, I don't want to leave you with the idea that this is just really hard and um, futile. So I'm, I'm going to mention the name of a book um, that I read a few years ago by Aldous Huxley called Island. Um, have, have you heard or read Brave New World? Anybody? So Brave New World was a dystopic novel and uh, the last novel that Aldous Huxley wrote was Island and it was kind of a revisiting of the idea of future society but he intended to make it a utopian society instead of a dystopian society and at the end of the book the utopian society is destroyed by the encroach, um, encroaching oil hungry corporate uh, devouring world anyway. So a lot of people have looked at that novel as, um, although he wanted it to be a utopian society, as like a, an exercise of futility that it's all um, negative and dystopic anyway. But I, I, I'm not saying that, that I agree with that. I'm saying that I disagree with that perspective on the novel. And I'm, I don't mean to spend too much time on it, but I think it's instructive uh, that one of the points and takes away, takeaways that I took from that novel is not that it's the ultimate result widespread that determines whether or not we were successful in our effort. It's what is the change that happened within each of us individually that matters for whether or not the transformation had any impact or change. So I, I need to do everything I possibly can to transform myself and transform my practice and help facilitate transformation within my field. If my field as a whole does not ultimately transform in the direction that I hope that it does, that doesn't mean that I'm going to fail in my transformation of myself. And it doesn't give me an excuse to neglect my responsibility to transform myself. That's, that's what I see as a takeaway from that novel, is regardless of whether or not ultimately the whole system changes, did my part in the system change? Did I go from being complicit to resisting and potentially even transforming, even if the only people I affect are me and my small circle to some degree? And so what I'm asserting is that that is worth it. Even if that's all we accomplish, that's huge because that's, that's all of me in my whole life, right? And that's all of each of you in your whole life. I don't know if that's making sense or if there are any comments. Chris offered a comment that I thought might be interesting to share. In corporate culture, the focus is typically on maximizing the application of the final product so that there is a resistance to making any learning content 
um, that is considered too niche. So one workaround he's suggesting maybe to take the critical interpretation approach, possible assessment instruct to the instructor notes or discussion points or assessment. What do you think about that? So if I'm understanding that right, and I'm sorry, I can't see the chat window. So just going on auditorily what I heard. If you can't do it directly and overtly, find stealth methods of disruption, stealth methods of resistance and transformation. I'm all for it. If that, if that was a fair interpretation of what the comment was. Chris, please uh, feel free to jump in. I'm sorry, I can't see a chat window to see whether Chris is jumping in. I don't, yeah, he has not yet responded, so he may be thinking. Okay, so jump in at any time. I'm just gonna ramble for a minute. I'm gonna go back to ideas of um, overt uh, curriculum and hidden and null. There are ways when, when we really understand how hidden curriculum works and how null curriculum works, there are ways we can make use of hidden curriculum and bring forward some values that, that we want to be embedded that can get past, you know, a, a filter. And, and we can take things that were in the null and move them at least into hidden, if not all the way over to overt. Was there more, Lisa? He said, uh, sorry, uh, in an open office, so Mike is not an option, but it, that's an accurate point. <laughs> in an open office, you said it's not an option? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite teachers in grad school reminded us often that um, really if, if you're going to be aware of what's going on socially and, and systemically, the injustices and the power, power dynamics and how people are harmed by that, if you're going to choose to be awake and aware of these things, you're going to have to kind of keep two books. And, and one of them is you, if you're going to exist in the corporate sphere in an open office setting, you can't overtly disrupt it. And I mean, you, you can't even covertly disrupt it on the big terms. I'm not saying, you know, destroy or burn down the company. Um, but if there are ways that you can bring those in sometimes by stealth without going into, you know, too much detail, that that's where we each get to decide what is, what is the range of comfort we have with remaining in a job, but making it um, so that we, that, that's why this is dialectic, right? Because there's not a single right answer and all of our contexts are a little bit different and we're all going to be responsible for figuring out what are the ways that I can coexist as an instructional designer in a corporate setting even where I see it's doing harm. Is this so unbearable that I need to leave my field? That I need to leave for a different job? Maybe I can find another company to work for that allows more space for this? Or can I find ways to exist in it while finding what might be stealthy ways to serve the company while also being able to live with myself as a human being, uh, trying to reduce the amount of harm uh, that I spread. Kay, did you have a comment? Oh, no, um, my comment was you don't give up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Figure out a different way to do it. And and sometimes with students, you never know when you're making a difference. A student might come up and you might be thinking that you're not doing enough yet. Whatever right. little resistance you, you put in there is something they come up and, and, and that they've grabbed a hold of. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that because um, some of you already know, and Kay, I know you've, you've heard me say this before, but the first time I gave a presentation at AECT where I specifically was pushing back against the mainstream, I was really scared before I walked in there. I thought people were going to be angry at me for questioning and problematizing some of the issues that I was seeing. And of course that didn't happen because people self-select to whatever session they want to go to. And I was so um, surprised and heartened by the audience that was there that were excited and exactly your point Kay that all of us or many of us are searching and struggling for a, a, a way to grapple with these issues that we sense but can't always articulate it so again even if we're not able to change the whole system or change the corporation or change the whole field of instructional design and technology sometimes just giving signals to other people that hey there's somebody else out here who is sensing these problems and is working toward finding ways to address them in 
ethical and humanist ways, just knowing that there are other people out there struggling with this is very heartening. I mean, it, 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 this was a time where I had decided I'm either going to leave the field or I'm going to have to change. And I'm, so I'm going to give, try to try to change my direction. And if I can't get uptake, maybe I'm going to have to leave. And I was, I was able to connect with so many people that I didn't realize many of them had been there all along looking for other people to connect with, to work on these things. So we can't expect the solutions to how do you do, how do you deal with this as an instructional designer in a tight system with different aims than what we might have personally. We, we can't, we can't expect that to be a quick fix. This is going to be something that we're going to have to be in a kind of a long haul with, with people from lots of different settings, um, helping us shift our thinking about. Are there other comments or questions? So the, the thing that um, keeps coming back to me is where, where it gets more concrete for me is when you talk about recognizing something that you're really uncomfortable with. So you see something where it's clear to you something's off, whether you can articulate what or not, you know, may, maybe you can see this feels, you know, this, this is a situation where it's it's not there's not an equal playing ground at all right? right or or maybe something just bothers you about it right but p honoring that and finding a way then to dig in and try to understand what is it that's bothering you yeah. and finding the people to have that conversation because once you get at that then you can start to think can i shift this do i try to shift this in designing a course do I try to shift this in some other way? Is this really a something where you know I need to be talking to to managers? I see there's a different issue in here. You know, people are being coerced into th through training into doing behaving a particular way in their jobs that does not serve them well. Absolutely. You know, right? What to to kind of to pay attention to where those spots are, to then think about how 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 can we address this. And, and maybe it's not directly through instructional design. Maybe it's in the, the larger context where you're looking at the underlying needs, where you can, you know, have some other kinds of conversations. Excellent points. Thank you so much for saying this. You're absolutely right. Uh, what I often, there, there's one of my classes where I, the class walks um, te new teachers through this praxis in their own context. And so I have them keep a, a tickle file um, where they just note, start noting the things in their daily work that trouble them or that bother them, even if they can't figure out what it is. And by paying attention to those things that aren't quite right, that aren't quite working, we can train ourselves to be more aware of and alert, even if we can't name them. And over time, we can start getting better at articulating what those are and finding other people who can talk about them and who, who can sometimes give us language to name the thing that we're experiencing that we didn't have. And you're absolutely right. If, if we don't do that, we can't get to the place where we think it's possible to address it because we don't even we don't even know what it is we're trying to address. So, really um, excellent points. Thank you very much for adding that. I'm gonna hit this one really quickly. I can't believe it's uh, 158. Are we quitting at two, Lisa? <laughs> oh, do we have till 2:30? We um, yeah. The, the uh, webinar was until now, but um, there is nobody that I know of that has this room scheduled, so we can go over if you'd like. Um, if you have to go, I'll understand. If you disappear, I hope you'll stick around. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go through these really fast, and then we'll make sure the link to the chapter is there again. Thank you. Um, so here's here's um, my comparison, and this is not meant to be written in stone and for all time, but this I used as a, a working benchmark for me of what are some touchstones about comparing educational technology, and you could change this to instructional design and technology or critical pedagogy. What are the foundations? What are the dominant philosophical underpinnings and orientations? And what are the priorities? Um, we can make this um, presentation as a PDF available too, if people want it. This is a continuation of what is what are the tendencies. In ed tech, we're taught to be efficient, efficacy and efficiency. So we're simplifying things, tending to support reinforcing systems um, find the gap in a system and fill it, which actually strengthens the overall 
system, as opposed to critical pedagogy complicates, see, sees interconnections, sees um, how entities without power, how people who are harmed by it, what can be done to give them access and give them power, which is by definition disrupting the, the working order of the system. So I'm going to cruise past this. This is just a reflection on um, how, how do we work toward equitable, inclusive praxis. Practice, praxis is uh, the key that I see for doing that. I'm just going to see where we are with, if there's anything else I want to make sure to hit on. Yeah, so the, the naming process, the chapter goes into more details on these. This is just a summary. This part of the chapter um, talks about what epistem epistemic epistemological ignorance is, The ignorance is contextual, that different patterns of ignorance are associated with different social and group identities. So if we think about our fields or our institutions or our uh, companies we work for, and the ignorance as a substantive epistemic practice differentiates the group from other groups and all that holds with, with our field or our companies. Um, the ways the ignorance um, operates, we're going to cruise on. So uh, if, if we want to jump over to that critical reflection, here are some starting points. Again, I'm not saying this is a procedure that you should follow in order to do it. These are just starting places that I have found useful. You'll have other suggestions, modifications. Please make it contextualized. Um, so expanding our reading list for sure, going beyond reading just the, the works that come through our own field or, or even through education. There are other um, academic fields and other practical fields that are during, doing work specifically focused on and prioritizing equity and inclusion and belonging um, and diversity and support. What are those fields? How do we access them? How, how can we bring in readings and experts from those fields that can help address our own um, ignorance? And then can we develop practices for self-reflection and critical self-interrogation? And I don't mean to say that we ourselves need to do this alone. So I do need to learn to ask myself questions, but I also need to learn to seek other people who can ask me difficult questions and who um, can withstand my resistance to answering those questions, who, who can come back and continue to work with me through my own process of growth. Right? And they can support me to um, accept imperfection and accept that I am a, a work in progress, right? And that knowledge is tentative and subject to revision, right? And, and that what, is, what I perceive as good today may not quite match with what I perceive as good a few years from now or a few encounters for now. So being willing to revisit what we know and find others who can help us do that is really important. And then the third part of praxis, the taking meaningful action. There are some steps here that um, are more developed within the chapter. I'm going to hit the last um, slide of the webinar so that we can get if there are any other questions before people have to have to go. I just want to reiterate that if, if our goal is to be more equitable in our practice and in our perceptions, um, critical pedagogy is a super useful lens for this because it is rooted in equity. It is rooted in um, transforming situations to be more just. It is um, rooted in the recognition of power dynamics and that people are harmed through uh, the way power dynamics are actualized and practiced. Um, and it also the recognition that we can't change other people to save them. So it addresses this, you know, potential for savior complex that many of us are kind of enculturated even within instructional design and technology that we're going to go in there and save the day because even though we're not subject matter experts, we know how to fix that subject matter so that it teaches. So, I mean, we're kind of enculturated into thinking, yeah, right, I can come save the day. We need to learn to question that and back off of that a little bit to recognize that the only way we're going to free and liberate other people is by working at least as hard on ourselves, like that we are the subjects that need the change and the transformation. Um, that there, This chapter that I wrote, it's just the tiniest taste of uh, critical pedagogy, but there are a lot of references included in it so that if 
uh, if you take the time to to do the reading of this. If you're not, you may already be experts on this, but I, I do offer several places that you can go for more information specific to um, many of the concepts that I included in there. Oh, there's that. So I'm I'm going to stop and see if there's anything anybody wants to add to the conversation or push back or ask. Well, I just want to thank you again, Amy. Um, please, if you have any questions, please keep typing them in the chat box or um, unmute your mic and ask them. But I do want to thank you again for uh, sharing your work with us today. This has been incredibly empowering and insightful for me. Um, I, I heard a lot of uh, familiar, you know, situations and contexts and also I was able to think of a lot of different ways that I can work. I loved how you said to focus on yourself, right? Um, I used to work in the charity field and everybody always said charity begins at home. Um, so this liberation begins at home uh, was also very powerful for me to hear. And I, I really appreciated that. Um, I got a lot of takeaways from uh, the audience members inputs too. Um, I won't go over them because I'm sure you guys all have that too. <laughs> I don't want to dominate the conversation, but um, thank you again. And uh, if anybody wants to um, contribute and, and join in a, a conversation, I have a few more minutes, but then I, I need to go too. But I'm going to stop the recording. So thank you so much, Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>